Today's topic will be women in the political sphere of Stalin's Soviet Union. As the Soviet Union cooled down from its turbulent nascent years, new ideas and principles which have taken on relatively nebulous forms in the past began to solidify and leave permanent imprints on society. Among these ideas was the resolution to the woman question, a topic that had pervaded both the international community and the late years of the Tsarist regime. How would the Bolsheviks handle this nationwide problem? The constitution that was drafted after the revolution had major implications for the roles of women in society. Women were made the political equals of men, allowing them to participate in the political process. On an international level, the Soviet Union was one of modern history's first countries to grant women explicit political equality. But as with many aspects of Soviet history, this development was more complicated than the words written on paper. For one, even within the time of Stalin's government, the official position and maternal realities of the country shifted. This resulted in noticeably different policies throughout the time Stalin was in the seat of power. Most distinctly, this time period could be divided into three parts, the pre-war period, wartime, and the post-war years. These three parts had strikingly different consequences for women in the political sphere. Wartime was the most obvious deviation from natural trends. As material realities were drastically altered, so too was the official position on women. It had to be forcibly changed to fit the new conditions. The post-war years retained some of these changes, but saw erosion or even regression of progress in other areas. Lynn Atwood outlines in her paper on representations of women in the Stalinist press two primary perspectives, the rationalist view and the romantic view. Simply put, the rationalistic approach to the woman question was one that saw women as a necessary component of the labor force, without which the progress of industrial development in the Soviet Union would be slowed. Rationalists believed there were no fundamental differences between men and women in the abilities to perform work of any sort, and thus there was no reason to segregate the society on such grounds. The romantic approach believed in more traditional roles for women, seeing them as the vital nexus of family stability and thus social order. The Stalinist era was ultimately a reluctant synthesis of the two approaches. As Atwood points out, the balance between the rational and romantic images remained precarious, with a continuing discomfort around the shifting boundaries of what were considered appropriate female roles. As a whole, the Stalinist period saw a dynamic evolution of the roles of women in political arenas, shifting at the turn of new material realities and adaptations of the party line. The earliest years of Soviet power saw explicit women's movements and organizations, such as the Zhenotdel, promoting interests of women in society. However, by the 1930s, there was a notable shift away from these independent women's movements. The party began to employ rhetoric along economic lines. This shift was made pretty clear by the likes of Kaganovich, who in the 30s pushed for dissolving the alleged obsolete Zhenotdel. The Zhenotdel was necessary, and in its time it did great work. However, now the majority of women are liberated, and therefore there is no longer a necessity of special organ given that this work will be taken up by the party. These comments followed a new constitution, which, unlike its predecessor, made explicit claims about the equality of sexes across all facets of life and society. The specificity and emphasis on political, social, and economic equality between men and women made it difficult for women to point out lingering inequalities that existed, de facto, in Soviet society. The woman question was therefore subsumed directly into the party and its regular functions. Naturally, such change radically altered gender relations and women's positions in the political sphere. The 30s quickly became a time when certain aspects of past gender roles were reinstated in society. Despite the shift toward traditional gender roles and the split burden of family life, party involvement, and everyday work, women did continue to see increasing participation in governmental and political organs. Petrov and Kokoreva suggest that increasing representation of women in electoral bodies could be attributed to strict party quotas for membership and distribution of positions. For example, starting in the 1930s, female membership in the councils of people's deputies rose from 27% to 50% by the mid-1980s. Compared to many modern liberal democracies, female representation from the lowest to the highest branches of government 
was exceptionally high in the Soviet Union. However, Petrov and Kokoreva also point out that not all scholars agree on the effectiveness of quotas. Some have shown quotas to be marginally impactful on the demographics of electoral bodies, citing ideological pressure as the reason for increased representation of women. The need to present an achieved sense of equality as a core tenet of socialism forced top-down initiatives to bring women into government. Thus, the activity of women in governmental and political organizations was not a true reflection of social relations, but a policy passed with gritted teeth to demonstrate the success of socialism as an ideology of equality. Regardless of incentives, women did continue to find themselves in positions of authority. Evdokia Vasilyevna Maslenikova was a Stakhanovite worker whose skill and sheer productivity put her on the radar as a candidate for administration. Starting her career as a barely educated young woman, Maslenikova took on a number of regional administrative roles and was even nominated to be elected as a deputy to the Supreme Soviet in 1938. A more famous example is the story of Pasha Angelina, a hardworking woman who became an elected leader. In 1930, Angelina was one of the only female tractor drivers in the Soviet Union. Faced with many obstacles, Angelina remembers working tirelessly and being recognized and hailed as a hero of the working people. Her efforts were noticed by the party, and Angelina was offered positions in the administration. She had her own brigade of women tractor drivers, and after breaking harvest records, she was elected in 1937 to the Supreme Soviet. She compares her success story to those of wealthy business people in the West, saying that while those individuals rose from the people, she rose with the people. Like many other women, she entered the political sphere by recognition of her work on the ground. Her expertise was noted, and she was encouraged to develop newer and faster ways to conduct her work. Angelina's entire family is, for her, a shining example of the success of the Soviet system. It is difficult to say whether or not the fate of Angelina and her family was dictated by her status as a hero of industrialization in the working class, that she may have been a poster child for socialist success. In her essay on Angelina as the legendary female tractor driver, Sue Bridger points out that, as early as 1930, the question of the national interest, rather than female emancipation, was clearly in the minds of those entrusted with promoting women's new endeavors. Bridger shows that by the end of the war, the number of women who were tractor drivers had dropped from its peak of 51% in the time of the war to 0.7% by the mid-1970s. Though the numbers suggest that, at least in the political sphere, participation and representation of women continued to grow throughout the course of Soviet history, this substantial drop in particular areas of employment shows the ephemeral nature of integration. As women began to enter politics, they were met with resistance. Some of the resistance was indirect and personal, but occasionally objections were public and rather pointed. In the case of a certain comrade Ulyanova, standing for election to the Central Committee of Trade Unions at the height of the purges in 1938, many members of the session to determine her status for candidacy were preoccupied with trivial problems. Most of the questions directed at Ulyanova pertained to her family life, with particular emphasis being put on her sister who had immigrated years earlier, and her husband with whom she was no longer living. The audience were so concerned about Ulyanova's family matters that they ended up voting against her candidacy. It is later noted that upon the summoning of her husband for further clarification, the issue of the divorce was resolved and Ulyanova was promptly elected to the committee. Though an in-depth study of such candidate sessions would be required before drawing definitive conclusions, it can quite reasonably be discerned that the main obstacle in Ulyanova's political career was her identity as a woman. After all, it was made clear to the audience at her hearing that she was a competent and experienced administrator, and no one refuted those claims. But the matter of familial relations was so troublesome that one has to wonder whether or not it would have been nearly as much of an ordeal if Ulyanova had been a man. This suspicion is further reinforced by the fact that the matter was resolved after her husband was called in a later session to verify Ulyanova's statements. Naturally, it is not impossible for Ulyanova's male counterparts to have encountered similar difficulties. At the peak of the 1930s when Ulyanova stood for election, family matters were made very public and any stain on the integrity of the family was taken as a liability of the individual. 
but considering the existing monopoly the male sex exercised over political activity, it would be inadvisable to overlook Ulyanova's treatment as one that is indicative of gender relations in the political sphere. During wartime, efforts were made to attract the best and most patriotic people to party organs and governmental positions. Particular emphasis was placed on encouraging working-class women to enter the political sphere. For example, by 1942, the Sverdlovsk Oblast Party organizations contained roughly 20,000 women party members, or some 30.1% of the membership. In light of increasing female membership, participation of women in political action, including agitational and propagandist work, expanded. The best women were sought out as examples of fine proletarians, fulfilling their work quotas two or three times over. Many women found that occupational success was a means to enter the party and secure managerial positions. This was the case for Antonina Alexandrova Bershnaya, who overcame her family's past by proving herself as an excellent worker and social activist. Her love for her work in refractory production and her dedication to her occupational duties drew attention from above. Like many Stakhanovites, Berzhnaia was active in agitational work, running study groups and organizing with workers. As she progressed in her career, Berzhnaia was responsible for overseeing more and more people until she was effectively in charge of all refractory material production in the Urals. Berzhnaia speaks of the difficulties of being a woman in such an elevated position, but her resilience was remarkable. At a certain point, she had a run-in with an abrasive co-worker, whom she singles out for being unnecessarily aggressive to her colleagues. She remembers telling him that she was elected by the people, and that she had the right to criticize him for his inappropriate conduct. In summary, Berzhnaia's story is perhaps one of the best examples of working-class women climbing the ranks of administration and becoming highly successful in their fields. Understanding the need to grow the size of both the workforce and the administrative body, the party and government pass resolutions to accelerate women's participation behind the front lines. Material and demographic circumstances of the Great Patriotic War mandated an inevitable shift in the burden between genders, as large segments of the working male population were sent to the front. As a consequence of these realities, women took on many roles previously dominated by men. Vasilieva shows that in provinces like Saratov, women's participation in political organs more than doubled during the course of the war, with female party membership increasing at similar rates. The Org Bureau released a resolution titled On the International Communist Women's Day of the 8th of March, in which it stated that the duty of the Council, Soviet, and Union organizations was to promote women to the places of administrative work in order to help them expand and develop their sphere of activities. This resolution had a considerable effect on top-down decisions to integrate women into administrative positions. In Udmurtia, the percentage of women holding managerial administrative positions grew from 9% in the pre-war period to 22.1% by July of 1941. Similarly, the Molotov Obkom reported a substantial increase of female secretaries and party offices, from 12.6% in 1940 to 29.9% in 1943. One of the political goals for the party and the government during the war was the restructuring and redirecting of party organization to meet wartime needs. Regions such as the Ural region, which found themselves well behind the front lines, were focused primarily on distribution of resources and meeting needs of displaced or materially challenged families. The resulting restructuring of party organization saw a dramatic change in the demographic makeup of party organs. By 1944, 60.9% of deputies in oblast Soviets were women. 59.8% of urban and regional Soviets were comprised of women. And 76.5% of agricultural Soviets were comprised of women. Women also played a crucial role in unions, which were at the center of the reconstruction process of industry and the economy. As materials and production were moved east, it had to be reestablished, reorganized, and revitalized. Here, too, women proved themselves to be highly active and competent administrators, organizers, and managers. Dovina believes that the increased activity of women in the political sphere was not only a great benefit to the party and the state, but provided long-term political, administrative, and managerial experience for those women involved in political organs.
During the war, necessity permitted the entry of a large number of individuals into the party. As this necessity disappeared at the end of the war, the party began to focus on a quality over quantity approach. The result was the exclusion of many party members who were considered not experienced or educated enough. Unsurprisingly, a majority of such members had joined during the war. For example, some 67% of those expelled from the party in 1946 were people who had joined during the war. Both men and women were subject to these purges, though for varying reasons. Where women were more often kicked out for the failure to learn party history, the frequenting of churches, or the disclosure of compromising information regarding their families, men were kicked out for theft of government slash public property, alcoholism, or inappropriate behavior in the workplace. Needless to say, as men returned from the front after the war, women felt a disproportionate push out of the political sphere. Of course, women continued to make up large portions of traditionally male workforces, i.e. heavy industry, construction, and agriculture. But, though the general quantity of women engaging in political activities continued to grow, the rate at which it grew slowed substantially. Post-war policies were heavily concerned with the rebuilding of a ruined economy and infrastructure. Thus, the government was entangled in differing ideological and pragmatic complications. Soviet ideology dictated the liberation of women through employment and professionalization, and the fact that women made up 60% of the labor force after the war made it an inescapable reality that they were needed for the economy. At the same time, demographic problems necessitated a boom in population that called for a return to more traditional gender roles for women, and subsequently for men. The result was a partial willingness to encourage female participation in politics and the economy, but also a reluctance to allow a continuous stream of women to penetrate new economic and political spheres. Elena Grigorievna Ponomarenko's story is one that reveals the complexities of women's roles in Soviet society, and how, despite their political involvement, their day-to-day -day lives were riddled with difficulties. Though Elena Grigorievna's activism and talent saved her from her destitute past, she continued to face issues with men in her private and work life, her husband was a drunkard and cheated on her, and Elena Grigorievna went through a good deal of emotional abuse before finally leaving with her infant son. In the workplace, her skills were sometimes questioned, and Elena Grigorievna herself admits that she often envied men and what they had. Nevertheless, she was able to secure a job for herself and even turned down a number of propositions for promotions and improved positions. This reluctance may have been a reflection of the uncertainty women continued to face in their lives, even in a society where they were, in theory, encouraged to participate in politics and the workplace. In conclusion, the years after the Second World War proved to be major outliers in the demographic makeup of the Soviet political sphere. Because the Soviet authorities recognized the need for increased production and management, and because the workplace was so interconnected with politics, Many women workers found themselves in positions of political power. From political activism to seats in the Supreme Soviet, women were thrust forward by both their own initiative and by national necessity. Though this wave of political involvement fizzled out substantially in the years after the war, many women remained in the political sphere with a good number of experience under their belts. But what about the debate between rationalism and romanticism? Does it apply to this analysis of Soviet politics? It would appear that the numbers reflect a more rational approach by the Soviet government. As economic and political need increased, and as a supply of men who traditionally filled particular roles dwindled, women were called to the mantle. Then the goals were directed elsewhere. The female composition in the political sphere changed too. Even the romantic leanings of the most socially conservative years could be attributed to a very rational way to solve demographic problems. Whatever the motives were, a large, though entirely unsatisfactory, number of women did manage to rise from the very bottom to very high positions in production management and political administration. The personal testimonies of these women show that this path was both unnerving and energizing at the same time. That's all for today's video. Many thanks to the people supporting the channel on Patreon. Your monthly contributions have already made a world of difference and will continue to improve the quality of the content. Thank you for watching. And until next time, remember, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it.